I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. That sentiment, plastered on the back of many cars that you'll be stuck in traffic come Monday morning, probably represents the majority of American workers. For many, work is a drudgery that you endure rather than a vocation one can embrace. In a recent study, it said that, that um, 49.6% of Americans are satisfied with their jobs. And from talking with brother pastors at pastors' conferences, I think that number is probably lower than that among pastors. But that 50% mark is the highest it's been in the last 10 years. It seems that in this age where job hunting is highly competitive, just landing a job is a big deal, and liking the job then would be actually icing on the cake. So what's the biggest downer about going to work? Well, according to another recent survey, it's not about the money. In fact, wages were quite far down on the list. For many employees, what makes the workday a bummer was that their employers don't listen to them. They don't know them, and they don't take their input seriously. As a result, employees don't feel like they're invested in the company. They don't feel like they're a part of the team. They see themselves only as worker bees who do what is required. It's the kind of thing that makes an employee feel like an interchangeable part of a machine. And then there is that relative value of employees to one another. As the job market gets tighter and the competition heats up even more for workers, they look around and they see who else is in the cubicles next to them. And they say, oh, this graduate who, who just is hired is making as much as I am, even though I have much more experience. All of this just doesn't seem fair. And perhaps that's what all this dissatisfaction is really all about. Fairness. We want, to be, we want what's coming to us. We want what we at least think we deserve in terms of influence and value and compensation. We want, especially those who are writing our reviews and signing our paychecks, to be fair. So, if you're one of those disgruntled employees or a member of a union, hearing the parable that was our gospel lesson probably raised your blood pressure a bit. You would likely think, oh, this is just the way the system works, isn't it? You grind out a full day of work and some Johnny-come-lately comes in and gets the same amount of pay as you do. To read the parable that way, however, betrays the bias that you have toward yourself and your relative worth. You see, Jesus in this parable is using absurdity, really, to make a spiritual point. I mean, no landowner would actually do what Jesus has the landowner in this parable doing. I mean, that would be like committing suicide for that landowner. Who would want to go work for him before the 11th hour from then on? But what Jesus is trying to convey here is that the kingdom of God cannot be seen in the lens of earthly reality. The kingdom of God is different and has a different set of values. Real value isn't determined by one's resume, one's compensation, one's seniority. In the kingdom of God, real value is not climbing to the top of the ladder, but holding the ladder for others. And that throws us into turmoil. It turns our world upside down. 
the context of this parable, though, um, is, comes from way back in chapter 19. When a young ruler walks up to Jesus and asks him or seeks from him assurance of eternal life. He's been a good boy and he thinks that this should put him on the top of God's favored list. But Jesus crushes his self-worth and challenges the young man to be perfect by selling all that he has, giving it to the poor, and following Jesus. It's an invitation to downward mobility. And who aspires to that? Ironically, though, it's often within that downward mobility that humans find true satisfaction and worth. Jesus turns to his disciples to teach them a lesson and says, you know, it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God because their self-worth is so tied up in their possessions. A person uh, might have a perfect spiritual resume, but if they're not willing to be generous with others, both physically and spiritually, then they'll be outside the kingdom of heaven. This troubled the disciples because they, like many in their day, felt that wealth was a sign of God's blessing, a la Joel Olstein today. Peter then pipes up and asks, Lord, what about us? We've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? And Jesus assures Peter and the others there that their sacrifice will certainly not go unrewarded. But, he says, if you want to be first in God's kingdom, you have to be willing to be last. Upside down. And so now we come to today's gospel lesson. What does this parable of seeming unfair labor practices teach us about the kingdom of God? How does it support Jesus' teaching of what really matters in the kingdom of God? I mean, the shock of this parable would have grabbed their attention and they would have been listening closely. So what's the point Jesus is trying to make? Well, let's see. The harvest is ready. And the landowner, serving as his own HR department, goes out into the marketplace to hire workers. The early birds were there, those that were eager to work and probably had the reputation of getting the job done. They agreed to a denarius a, a day, which is a generous offer, because you've got to remember, in Palestine at that time, only Roman soldiers received a whole denarius per day in Palestine. So that was a generous offer that Jesus was get, making with these workers. The landowner makes the offer, the workers agree to the offer, and they go off into the vineyard to do the work. But as any vineyard owner knows, when the grapes get to a certain point, you have to pick them at that point. You have got to get them at that height of when they the have the most sugar in them or else they'll spoil. So he goes out to the manpower workplace again at 9 in the morning, at noon, at 3, and again one last time at 5 o'clock in the evening. He's got to get those grapes out of the vineyard. Now, you can imagine that the, the five o'clock crew probably weren't the sharpest tools in the shed because no one had picked them throughout the whole day. They were still standing idle in the marketplace. The assumption that Jesus hearers had and that we would have is that Jesus would pay them commensurate to the amount of time that they had worked. After all, that's only fair. But you know what they say about assumptions. 
When it's time for the laborers to be paid, and laborers were paid at the end of every day back then, they didn't wait two weeks or a month to pay after of work to be paid. They were paid after every day. The owner has his foreman go and line them up and says, pay the last group first. And when the last group come, they receive an unbelievable pay stub, a whole denarius for just one hour of work. You can imagine the murmur that went through the line then saying, hey, these guys, they got a whole denarius for just one hour of work. You can imagine what they were thinking. What are we going to get, us who worked three hours, six hours, nine hours, the whole day? But when the six-hour group comes in, or the three-hour group comes in, they get a denarius as well. And so does the six-hour group. And the murmuring turns into grumbling. Everyone, regardless of the hours, is getting the same amount. Totally not fair. We can empathize with the early bird people, right? I mean, we would expect to receive more because of the relative worth of our work that day. But everyone is being prayed the same. What would they do? What would we do? Well, they did exactly what we would do. They filed a complaint with the HR department, which in this case happens to be the landowner himself. You know, they, uh, they uh, uh, filed their grievance to, and sought redress there. They saw their labor as having wor being worth more since they worked the whole day. But the landowner reminds them that they're getting exactly what they contracted for at the beginning of the day. He, doesn't, he wasn't doing them any wrong. He says, and he asks them, can I not do what I want with what belongs to me? Or, then he says, are you envious because I'm generous? And there is the moral of the story and the point for us. Yes, God, we are envious of your generosity, materially and spiritually. We wonder why unbelievers and ne'er-do-wells seem to prosper while we struggle in this life of ours. We don't like the, the forgiveness policy that you have, God. You know, why did you forgive that man who hurt me so bad? Why did you forgive that parent that abandoned me when I was so young? Why do you make me equal with this criminal who makes a deathbed confession? Yes, we are envious of God's generosity. But it seems that this parable isn't quite original with Jesus, at least to a certain point. The Jewish leaders also told this parable, but to make the exact opposite point. They said that Israel, who had worked long and hard and fulfilled their work throughout the whole years there, would receive more in the kingdom of God than the Gentiles, these Johnny-come-latelys. They would receive less. So like the young ruler, the Jewish people thought that because they were chosen, they would have priority status in God's kingdom and a little extra because of their faithful labor over time. But Jesus reveals that God's kingdom economy doesn't work that way. God chooses to be generous and extend the same grace to the last and the least as he does to those who think that they have earned it. In fact, in the verses right after us, it, it tells us how far Jesus was willing to go that he would give himself over to both the Jewish rulers and the cruel Gentiles and die for both of them. 
Jesus turns Jewish thinking upside down. He criticizes the Jewish people for thinking that they are special because they're the chosen people. Jesus reminds them that when it comes to salvation, it doesn't matter how long you've been in the kingdom of God. Whether you are a charter member or a new member, God's grace is given in the same amount to both. In the amount needed to be saved. What matters is the generosity of God, not your time in grade. So to follow Jesus is really to join Martin Luther in reminding ourselves of our status before God. Luther, Luther's last words on his deathbed should be a reminder to us all of our status. He said, what beggars we are before our God. We join Jesus in this downward mobility. It means giving up our resumes, spiritual and otherwise, and recognizing that recognizing our insufficiency and need for grace. It means laying aside our quest for power and wealth and embracing a life of generosity, finding our satisfaction not in the things that we have, but the fewness of our wants. It means understanding that our worth is not found in titles and power, but in service to others. It's upside down. Upside down from the world. I know. But according to Jesus, it's what leads to ultimate satisfaction. And now may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand